Sure. Which was your um, proposal on universal school lunch? Yeah. Which was not going to be at this point. I think it's going to be a part of the No, it's not. I'm going to have Lieutenant Governor talk a little bit about this. Lieutenant Governor had a story when all of us of a certain age, I remember Lieutenant Governor and I were talking when we first met, this was years ago, and she said that she knew very clearly what it was like to be the kid with the other colored lunch ticket, which other kids knew who was getting free and reduced lunch and how sometimes we were creating a, a caste system and uh, unintentionally. And I think our point is on this is that the amount of food that goes to waste, the capacity of this country to be able to feed our students, the research that shows what happens when we do it, and removing that stigma. We just felt that in the long run, the savings we get with healthy families, uh, healthy children, with that start, and removing that piece of the accountability piece, not, not accountability of the dollars, but accounting on which kids got it and not that there was a simplification. Our food service folks told us it would make it simpler, and we just thought it was the right thing to do, that no child should have to... Uh, to worry about that. No child should have these lunch tickets that end up teachers trying to pay off or they get turned away, the lunch shaming piece. And we just felt strongly that it was a time to go. Okay. I think you can, uh, you will see that we will continue to push for universal meals uh, for kids across Minnesota. But this is one of the ways that we can work in partnership with districts to make sure they're taking advantage of the federal funds that are available and expanding access to food to as many students as possible. As the governor just said, it's, it's smart. It's a great long-term investment for building brains and healthy kids, and they do better in school. Uh, this is something that when I was with Children's Defense Fund, we actually worked on expanding uh, the school breakfast program um, and working with uh, districts uh, to, to take this on. And so this is a continuation, I think, in many ways of, of that work. Uh, and we remain committed to making sure that our kiddos have full bellies, and this is one of the ways that we can um, uh, make progress in that area. I think uh, we will be studying the effects of this pandemic for a long time to come. Um, we know that we have certainly all suffered losses big and small. Uh, but one of the positives, I think, to your point, is that uh, feeding kids <laughs> is something that works. And we know that over uh, the last few years, making sure that families had access uh, to food in schools uh, across the state has made a tremendous difference. And um, I think there is a normalization uh, of this, and I think that's powerful. Uh, it should not be controversial or controversial uh, that kids have full bellies and a place that they go every day. You know, we were at a school um, just this year when one of the social workers uh, at Hilltop Elementary, when one of the social workers talked about how important access uh, to food was at school, because she told me a story of one of the families uh, that she worked with uh, whose children uh, were eating crayons because there wasn't enough food in the house. Um, that should be unacceptable, and if there's something that we can do in our public schools in Minnesota to feed kids, we should do it. That's a good question. I'll note, too, that... Um you're right, it's not in there at the end. Our attempt to, uh, to negotiate a deal meant that, that we needed to move. I, I'm with the Lieutenant Governor, I don't quite understand why this one was controversial, but it appeared to be a line that Republicans in the Senate were not going to cross, um, so we compromised. But um, we're not done with the issue, we certainly have more to do. Yeah, well, and I, I do believe that. I don't, I think you, especially in a legislative deliberative body, you, you've got to have some end dates. I feel very strongly that we, you know, when you have that end date, it creates, um, it creates some leverage. But the biggest thing is getting the work done. And this idea that the clock ran out, and I still believe, we remember we had an agreement, four, four, and four. And I think the more I see this now is I think there's a lot of buyer's remorse in the Senate over this issue. Um, we have continued to compromise and move, we being the speaker. I met with the speaker this morning. She and I are both committed to getting a deal done, trying to get 
you know, last best offer here to get something done. Um, I, I think that the real problem here is to be candid, if folks are going to be candid about this, we've got members of the Senate who have primaries in August and they don't want to be seen as compromising on anything, um, Republican senators. And I think that's holding up our ability to be able to move some things. I'm still absolutely convinced this is a fantastic opportunity to do the things that Minnesotan are asking us for. And as I said yesterday, I think now is the time to put checks back in their pockets for gas. I think it's time to honor the largest tax cut in state history. And it's time to make sure that those major priorities we had around education, around public safety, around transportation, making sure our nursing homes, our child care workers were taken care of. Those all are out there. Again, all possible could be done right now. I still think, and I'm hearing from everyone um, out in the public, get this thing done. And, and that framework is still there to be able to do that. So um, I don't think you can hang indefinitely, but, but I, I do believe progress is still being made. There's negotiations on HHS yesterday. Commissioner Harpstead said she is optimistic that exchange of ideas are still happening. I'm talking to stakeholders in this, long-term care folks. Um, you know what a challenge this is. State of Minnesota just took over the one long-term care facility that could no longer provide the services to their members. We, we can't just let the bottom fall out of this. Um, so I'm in agreement with Senate Republicans um, and, and Democrats that those services and that surplus we have could make a difference now, not next year. Did Speaker Horton uh, show any renew, express any renewed interest in rebate checks when he spoke with her this morning? Because her caucus didn't support that. You know, I don't want to speak for her. I, I, I brought it up because I think the situation has changed since May. I think the economic outlook has changed. I think the state's position. I, I just think at this point in time where Minnesotans could get immediate relief having that cash in hand, especially for inflationary costs on gas and food, um, we were just going to set that on the bottom line. It wasn't rainy day funds. Our rainy day funds are at the maximum level. They're historically filled. There's high. They're, they're good um, for now. So we're concerned. I'm concerned. Economic downturn. But that $4 billion was sitting there to go into the next legislative cycle, which would mean next January. But all of you are not naive. The soonest they're going to get to that is next May, basically a year from now. My point is, why leave surplus that belongs to the public sitting there and add it down? And I mentioned that to her. We did not. She said she would take it back and, and continue to talk about it. I, uh, I don't think that it was an opposition in House Democrats to checks. I think they just thought, why burn political capital if the governor and lieutenant governor are carrying that? I think it makes more sense now in the economic situation we're in. I, I think it was Theo or someone asked yesterday, and they're absolutely right. The tax cuts, whether you like, you know, whether you're supportive of them or not, you'll not see an impact on families in the short run because of that. But I'm not asking them to pick between the tax cut and checks. I'm asking them to do both, um, as well as education and what we see for um, what we see making a difference in public safety, and then of course the federal transportation dollars makes absolutely no sense not to take those. So your, your, your comment a few minutes ago about you thinking of the August primary as something to do with the hesitancy of I do. Does that mean that you don't think there will be a final answer on the special session until August 9th or beyond? Well, this is me trying to extrapolate and trying to, I, I try and do this. I, I can't speak for how Republicans are thinking. I'm telling you just candidly what I think is, is that I think there's a significant number of folks in the Senate who would like to get a deal done and know this is fair and know that things from nursing homes to tax cuts to education are important. You saw us do this here. You saw some of that. But I also think there's at least a significant number who don't want to do anything on that. And I, I worry that we've seen some of these primaries from the right disrupting what appeared like at times we had deals on things. And it, to be very candid, we were at a time, I'm, I'm still a little bit kind of confused on how the 444 deal ended up not getting, not getting through. I mean, it was pretty much buttoned up when we did that. There was just a few things. I mean, we're really, again, we're, we're, we're probably 34th, million dollars out of a billion dollars in education. I know Commissioner Harpstead and her team is working diligently around their target number. Um, not a lot of disagreement that our nursing homes need help. Not a lot of disagreement that our child care providers need help. Um, so I just state that as a reason why I'm trying to figure out because I got to be honest with you, I cannot for the life of me figure out why they can't take yes for an answer on this. this I, I, I ask all of you been covering this a long time. If you would have been told 
that the Republican Senate would turn down the largest tax cut since 1858. And the reason is, well, we're just not comfortable at this point with, and then it's blank after that. Not comfortable with what? Not comfortable with what? It's what we agreed on. It's things that the public wants. I, I think there's still a golden opportunity. And I, if you're not hearing from people about gas prices, you are not listening. You are not listening to your family. You're not listening to the lieutenant governor. You're not listening to people who are telling you this is a global issue. It's very difficult, even on a federal level, to make a short-term impact on this. We have a tool to do that. We have a tool right now that would take that sting out of everybody who, who would need that you know, to, the, to the, name, you know, the number of, at the current price, of 500 gallons of gas for every Minnesotan. Uh, that makes a difference. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Appreciate it.